So my talk is going to be very different than the previous one. Uh, if you are not directly involved in crop management and you don't do um, too much, uh, you know, field work uh, actually on your farm, um, you know, this talk may not be of your uh, interest because um, I'll talk about a lot of the technical stuff in the talk. Um, so weed is something that we all have a little bit uh, in our home, yard, garden, farm. You know, some people manage better, some people don't. Uh, this also depends on how much time and the money you actually spend on it. Uh, for most of the people, or for, I should say for the majority of people, whenever they have weeds come up or any, any type of insects or disease come up on their crops, typically the first thing they think about is spraying pesticides. Um, I don't blame them. Um, that is the most effective way and quickest way to get rid of some of this stuff. Today, I'm gonna talk about potentially reducing some of the uh, uh, herbicide volume that you spray because they're short and they're expensive these days. And also increasing the uh, sustainability with uh, cover crop, because if you have cover crop in this field and you use the cover crop to cover the ground naturally, a lot of those cover crop can actually surprise, suppress uh, quite a bit of weeds for you. For example, you can utilize multiple strategies. <laughs> you know, natural cover crop will be the best because it's gonna be the cheapest way for you to grow, grow your own uh, straw residue instead of paying people to get pine bark needles or fabrics like those. You know, those uh, weed tarps or weed fabrics are actually quite effective if you wanna use them. They typically last a few years, um, but still you have to buy them and they don't last forever. Um, so it's, it's good and bad at the same time. But all these are considered to be uh, physical weed control. You know, you're basically uh, including a barrier uh, over the soil, over the top of your field to prevent weeds from emerging. This strategy has been used on multiple types of crops, you know, including row crops, uh, vegetables, fruit trees, and you can see all the pine barks covering uh, around the uh, blueberries, and then you get uh, Bermuda, uh, uh, Bermuda grass occupying the rest of the area. This is actually a very good strategy because you're not gonna have much weeds from anywhere from coming up. Uh, so this picture looks pretty good. You know, fabrics, uh, that, that's something that you can always use uh, when you have perennial crops. Uh, seems to work better on perennial crops than annual crops. All right, so uh, talk about cover crop a little bit more. Um, that's going to be the main focus of the talk. So we run lots of cover crop study every year. Uh, most of these are in the row crops. I have done some work with, with vegetables a couple of years ago as well. So for this trial, uh, everything was clean when we terminated the cover crop, just cereal rice with no nothing else. And then if you have a lot of weeds in the field, particularly the broadleaf weeds, they will penetrate through your cover crop residue. And then they will explore any holes that you have in those cover crop and establish themselves. So it didn't take long, about two weeks later, you can see this thing showing up uh, in, in your cover crop area. However, that is still a lot better than if you don't cover the ground at all. Because if you don't, this is how much weeds you can have in a bare ground area. You know? So cover versus no cover, there's a quite a bit of difference. On some of the small seed weeds, uh, like pigweed or palmer amaranth or grasses, you can get over 60%, even 90% natural suppression because of the cover, all right? So uh, some people asked me before, does cover crop residue work on all weeds species? The answer is definitely no. So in this test, we plant four different weed species in soil flats. Each soil flat was filled by organic soil. So we plant the morning glory, uh, sickle pod, pigweed, and a crabgrass in all those flats. We either we don't cover them at all, or we cover them with different 
uh, amount of cereal rye uh, grain straw that we harvested from the field. You can see from morning glory, whether you cover 2,500 pounds or 10,000 pounds, it does not make much of a difference. Morning glory will have a way to penetrate through the cover one way or the other because the seed size is pretty big. It has a lot of pushing power. For a sickle pod, we see a little bit of reduction in germination, but still not too much because the seed is fairly large, close to soybean seed size. For pigweed, it is more effective when you have more residue covering the ground because the seeds are very small and they don't push uh, very hard uh, or they cannot push very hard during the germination process. Crabgrass is similar uh, to uh, uh, pigweed. All right. Um, looking at some data, um, you know, the, uh, the four type, four colors of bars represents four weed species. For crabgrass and palmer, you can see how the germination decreased as the cereal rye biomass increased on soil flats. However, for uh, morning glory and the sickle pod, those uh, germination rate stay flat for most of the time. They did not respond to um, uh, cover crop residue very well. So this is a picture I found on the internet. I don't know who took the picture, um, but it looks pretty good. And I kind of uh, curious how the GSCVRI established so thick around the uh, plastic. So we started to, you know, that was a couple of years ago. So we started to do some of our own trial, try to figure out the best way to establish cereal rye uh, in between the uh, plastic beds. All right, so our initial attempt was to uh, rototill a strip in between the cover crop in early February. And then that this is how after we strip till um, the uh, cover crop area, and then we formed the bed in those uh, bare strips. Uh, the issue is the strip till was wider, or way wider than the bed. Uh, and then this create a uh, bare ground gap right next to the uh, plastic bed. That is not good. You can see the two strips of bare ground uh, that we uh, also rototilled uh, in, you know, on, on each side of the uh, plastic bed. All these bare ground strip uh, create a lot of weeds uh, down the road and they get really weedy, you know, see that, that two strip right there. That's basically where I didn't have the cover crop. It was all occupied by uh, uh, crabgrass and not such. So to improve the way we do things, we'll adopt a different strategy the following year. So this time we established the plastic beds in the fall, in October, we did it early. And then instead of playing with the rototiller and the grain drill, we didn't even use a grain drill this time. So after we formed the bed and, uh, you know, it was all just bare dirt, you know, fresh teal dirt. And then we spread very heavy rate of uh, cereal rye seeds over the top of the whole section you know, on top of all the beds. And then we basically just rely on the rain to wash uh, all the cereal rye seeds uh, into the row middle because they don't stay on top of the plastic. The rain eventually washed off all the seeds into the row middle and naturally established. So the rye was able to naturally establish to ensure seed soil contact. We actually use the tractor to run in between the beds a little bit, you know, to kind of run the seeds into the soil a little bit. And then we also put down a good amount of fertilizer, particularly nitrogen at the, uh, at the beginning, you know, after we spread and also we fertilizer, fertilize the uh, cereal rye uh, before jointing stage. So you can see in February, I got some really thick rye uh, and some other cover, we have some other cover crime in this test as well. They get real thick. You know, you still get wild mustard or wild radish, you know, here and there, uh, you know, in, in the uh, row middle. But compared to the non treaty check Baragran row middle, which is totally occupied by the weeds, it's a, it's a lot better to have your uh, cover crop there. 
And also before termination, uh, around the end of uh, March, uh, we get pretty tall and really thick cover crop in the row middle. You cannot even walk through it. We also had some treatment with uh, crimson clover uh, to increase the, uh, uh, the uh, nitrogen a little bit for the soil. So if you want to mix some legume with your green uh, cereal grain cover crop, you can do that as well. So this is, uh, you know, the two plots where you have some plots with full of cover crop and the legume versus full of wild radish, all kinds of winter weeds in the middle, all right? So that's the difference between uh, the uh, treatments before termination, before transplanting. So four weeks after transplanting, uh, the non-treated uh, beds were full of weeds, you know, non-treated plots, they were covered by weeds all kinds of different weeds. This is where we uh, terminated the winter weeds and uh, lay down the uh, chateau uh, or, or in, in your row crops called Valor, it's the same chemical. This is where we burn down the winter weeds and lay down the chateau. You can still kill all the weeds that, that, uh, that exist in the, in the area where you don't have the cover crop, but it's gonna take these are the amount of chemicals and potentially repeat the application to do it. And also when it gets to spraying chateau or most of the herbicides over the top of vegetable beds, you don't want to do something that we did. Because when, when we spray chateau, we drift it on the plastic. And then after it rains, they wash all the chateau into the planting hole. This is why we didn't have much pepper or watermelon on these beds in the first place. So this is something definitely causing concern. If you have a big old self-propel sprayer and you spray not only the raw middle, but also spray over top of the tarp, you got to have a decent amount of rainfall, irrigation, and a plant back restriction, all those, all those good stuff before you can plant. If you plant too soon before the herbicides are washed off from the plastic, you're going to end up with some empty planting holes. You know, transplants are dead. We also had a treatment where we established the white clover. I, it is a good strategy for perennial crop, I think. If you have white clover yeah, strips in between your blueberry, your, you know, your cherry trees or apple trees or you know, peach trees, um, uh, you know, I think that would be a good strategy. You may still have to spray that strip, uh, you know, right next to the uh, the crop, you know, for, or right around the trees, because you don't want to have these type of perennial cover crop competing against your trees. You might have to spray individual tree and kill a circle for a couple of feet wide, you know, uh, or radius, something like that. So in this test, we're basically just throwing white clover as a as a uh, uh, interesting idea to play with. They establish itself pretty well after one season, after one winter, and uh, and then it, it was getting pretty thick in the summer. This is a perennial crop. This is a Dutch white clover, and you can spray 240 on it to kill other broadleaf weeds. But the problem is uh, all these green uh, cover, whether these are green weeds or green cover crops, they tend to draw uh, insects, and they also increase your disease pressure in the field. So my PhD student observed the significant more uh, watermelon disease in the, in the um, white clover plots. Uh, that's something to think about um, when you use perennial cover crop in an annual production system. All right, for cereal rye and the crimson clover uh, treatment, uh, we rolled it down grain. Actually, we didn't roll it. We basically just used tractor to run, run this thing down in the row middle. And no herbicides was sprayed up to this point when the picture was taken. All the weed suppression came naturally from the cover crop compared to the non treaty check picture I showed. This is how much weed suppression you get naturally from the cover crop residue. You know, so far no chemical has been sprayed at, at this point. This is uh, our cereal rye and crimson clover roll down grain. And after we rolled it down grain, we put a chateau over the top uh, of the uh, roll middle. Um, uh, we probably killed a few transplants because of the drift, um, but still uh, the weed control was pretty good uh, compared to where we just rolled it green and didn't spray no pre. You know, pre is chateau in the road middle. 
All right, this is not really checked eight weeks after transplanting. And then this is a chemical control background plus started with Chateau four ounce and then post with Sandia 0 0.75 ounce. Um, Pepper seems to recover a little bit from this, uh, the Chateau or Valor drift, uh, but still uh, we lost a lot of plants here. But you can see the, the row middle stayed fairly clean eight weeks after planting. All right, this is a white clover plus. Uh, looks like white clover did a good job holding most of the weeds back, but disease is a concern for the uh, cucurbits. For rye and a crimson clover, this is the plot. We roll down gray, didn't spray no pre, no chateau, and only sandia to the roll middle. All right. It did an okay job, but, but you can see a lot of morning glory over here in some of these plots because they didn't get no pre in the roll middle, no chateau. This is where we roll down the uh, silver rye and the crimson clover green. We spray chateau over the top and uh, over the top of the uh, uh, row middle, over the row middle, and then did a uh, post emergence of sandia in the row middle. Uh, when you spray two shots of chemicals in the row middle and plus uh, cover crop residue, you start to get pretty clean, even at a very weedy area. Now we have seen this uh, effect in the past in row crop many times as well. So uh, Valor is the row crop version of Chateau, you know. So basically we sprayed same rate of Valor on cereal rye residue versus on bare ground conventional teal plots after we plant the peanut. 68 days after planting, we didn't spray any, any herbicides after pre. And then 68 days after planting, I still have four row plots, four row peanut almost overlap the canopy where I spray full race of adder on zero rye residue versus where I spray on bare ground conventional teal um, plots. Uh, this plot was full of, uh, full of sickle pod and pigweed. Um, so that's the combination effect of, of herbicide and a cover crop, which always work fairly good. All right, in terms of other potential treatment, uh, if you do have a lot of nuttage, um, you know, like what I have here in the non-treaty check, uh, one treatment that worked out pretty good as a residual was highest rate of Chateau combined with high residue magnet. Uh, this can only be sprayed in the row middle. But if you are able to manage your, uh, uh, your nutsage uh, very aggressively for a few years, you will reduce the overall pressure in the whole field. You can see the clear cut line where we cut off our boom and, and didn't spray beyond that point. It's like almost straight line cut by a knife. You know, that's how good the chemical work in this case. All right. Um, so uh, I'll show some more uh, plot pictures uh, from different herbicide treatment. Uh, this is something, some of the plot work we sprayed uh, a couple of years ago. Cleanest one is definitely Chateau, uh, there's no doubt, as long as you don't drift onto the tomato. I'm glad in that case we didn't drift on the, on the, on the bed, on the tarp, you know, and kill the transplants. Versus Sandia pre, Trifoline pre, or Tricor pre for tomatoes. And you can see a difference here for sure. Tricor, which is Metribuzin, uh, it's also a big soybean herbicide, did a fairly good, um, but still Chateau was hard to beat, you know. A lot of vegetable growers use Trafalan, Sonolan, and Frau, this type of yellow herbicides. They still work, but they don't work very well compared to some other chemistries in terms of uh, weed suppression. All right, I'll also show some data real quick. You know, we have grass, annual grass, carpet weed, ragweed, pigweed, you know, in this, in this test. Uh, this, is, this is where we spray the tomato roll middle. Chateau was very hard to beat, almost giving us over 90% or 100% for all these weeds. Reflex is in the same chemistry, has the same chemistry of Chateau. Those are, those work very similarly, just not as hot as Chateau, but Reflex roll middle did pretty good as well. This is a tricor, you know, it did good on pigweed and ragweed, but not so good on carpet weed and any grasses, all right? For Sandia, Trifle and Dew, you know, they were just trading behind quite far compared to the top options. In watermelon, Chateau was still the cleanest. Uh, some other treatment like strategy or Kirby, you know, or Sandia, we have a lot of grasses uh, came up in those plots. Uh, still looking at the same four weeds, the uh, treatments suppressed, the treatment that suppressed those weeds the best was Chateau. 
Uh, Reflex had a similar control, but Chateau was still the best, you know, for Rack and Pigweed. That's basically 100% control. All right. And then, you know, strategy, Sandia, command, do Magnum, yeah, variable results. You're not going to be very pleased with some of this stuff used by themselves, including traffic, like, you know. So um, that, that was the individual herbicides. We also sprayed a few uh, two way mix um, when we just laid the bed and see how long they hold the weeds back. Uh, Triathlon with Sandia didn't do a good job on the grasses. Uh, although many growers believe yellow herbicides can hold back the grasses, that's not always true. You know, when you get this much of grasses, they don't work very good. This is Chateau Forest by itself. You know, row middle was clean. We got some big old crabgrass came out from the old plastic, from the holes on those plastic. This is reflex with dew, fairly clean the row middle, just a few sickle pods, you know, get hurt and still made through the ground. Strategy by itself at full rate, uh, not too terrible, but you still got some uh, grasses came out along sickle pot. This is Chateau, Trafla, and Sandia. I believe if you take Sandia out, just do Chateau with Trafla, you're going to get very similar results as well. This is Reflex by itself because Reflex is in the same chemistry uh, as Valor uh, or Chateau. So Chateau or Reflex, they should both look good. Uh, Chateau probably will last a little bit longer than Reflex. Uh, if you use a higher rate. All right, uh, so talk about the equipment a little bit. Uh, most of our growers are fairly small in specialty crops. They don't have a whole lot of acreage. Many of those are for you pig or support a um, farmer's market. Some of them may have a roll, a roll side, a vegetable stand, you know, just sell produce off the road. So in that case, uh, most of the growers like to use smaller equipment. You know, uh, they require low, much lower initial investment. They are easy to manure in small fields. Uh, they are user friendly when you have to deal only with, you know, say 10 acres or 20 acres. So you can afford to use some of this small stuff and still get a job done, uh, which is an advantage. But, you know, you. You just have to utilize uh, some of these uh, smaller uh, tools uh, uh, to properly spray the raw middle, you know, to do a roto teal or to cut the weeds with bush chalk. You know, whether this is mechanical control or chemical control or cover crop combined with chemical control, they all work. Uh, some work better than the other, um, but the key thing is to prevent a field being overrun by weeds and the weeds, you know, uh, produce a lot of seeds because you just leave the fields there sitting there for a very long time in the summer. You didn't do anything until you're ready to plant a crop. You know, you can still clean up the weeds, but the weed seed bank, the amount of weed seeds in the soil is very high. So that's why the uh, fallow management or weed management during the fallow period is very important. You still have to bush hog in that field consistently or, or repeatedly and prevent the weeds from over on that field, all right? And also go back to this uh, herbicide injury issue, you know, multiple herbicides, including Sandia, Reflux, Dew, or Chateau, they all have the capability to injure your transplant if you spray them before you transplant and they got washed if and if they got washed into the planting hole you know that's this is sandia damage on squash you know reflex damage on uh on cucurbis yeah. uh this is on cantaloupe uh and also i showed this picture before this is all our chateau damage on pepper and a melon you know pretty much kill all the peppers we transplant because of the spray drift you know, it probably drift a little bit when my student worker spray these. So this is something that you all have to be careful when you spray the row middle. And also talk about the, the uh, uh, herbicide injury and the crop stress detection a little bit. So these days uh, we started to fly a lot of drones. Uh, I have uh, three drones now and for fixing to get the fourth one. Uh, spray drone, scouting drone, they're all very capable of doing many different things. There are new tools that enable us to scout the field much more precise. This is a peanut field, and you can see the good and the not so good area uh, in RGB and NDVI, all right? All these yellow spots were caused by waterlogging, 
magnesium or calcium deficiency because calcium and magnesium are important for heat up. The last summer was just super wet. You can see at October the 4th, before digging, before a, a crop harvest, there are still plenty spots in this field that peanut barely overlap the ground and they become very yellow. All right, that's a prolonged stress, water, uh, excessive water uh, stress, and also the nutrient deficiency. You know? But there are some good areas over here around the pivot. Also, I talk about Chateau of Valor injury. This field was also injured by Valor. This whole section here was caused by valor uh, damage, all right, because when Pino was cracking the ground, it rained and washed valor into the crack. This was caused by herbicide, and then they stunted the Pino quite, for quite a while, almost for two months. And then Pino slowly grow out of this after grower put a, um, a foliar fertilizer over the top. So you can see the injury slowly recover. However, where he had all this nutrient deficiency and water logging problem down here around the terraces, that deficiency only progressed and getting even worse, you know, down here because the nutrient deficiency will not correct by itself. All right, but this, this images or this analysis does give a grower a tool to precisely manage the field and correct some of those issues identified in the previous crop. You know, for example, drainage issue, um, a water logging issue, uh, um, nutrient deficiency, pH problem, uh, disease or nematode problem, you know, for example, because nematodes and pH, you know, sometimes that, you know, that people have those problems, they will not move in the field. You can see the pattern fairly well. All right, so this is a, how a good field look like, you know, this whole field was like 40 some acre and then the, the whole field in EVI was 0.87, it's a below the roof number, very, very high. So at the end of the season, this cotton field was able to yield almost three bale. You know, that's very hard to do, almost 1,300 pounds. All right, so if your crop has good yield potential, we can usually see it uh, before the crop was even closed or, or being very, before the crop was close to harvest. This is a new tool uh, that um, you will see in future. All right, this is our new spray drone. It works for multiple crops, including vegetable, fruit trees, row crops, pasture, and hay field, just basically wherever you need to spray. It is controlled by GPS. Actually, it's controlled by RTK signal, even more precise than GPS. So precision level between the passes is usually within two centimeters or within one inch. And you can spray this for this model, you can spray about 20 to 25 acre uh, per hour. And one controller is able to control three at the same time. So your efficiency can actually be, be multiplied by three. It will spray over the top when the field is too wet, your ground sprayer cannot get into it. And also spray wear uh, uh, section, uh, wear shape uh, fields, narrow section where your big sprayer may not work well and also spray on terraces, you know, uh, fields that are not level because whenever you spray on terrace, one side of the boom is scratching the dirt. The other side of the boom is sticking into the air and cause a lot of drift. And also when you turn on a round terrace, the inside, the inside, you know, the boom on your left, uh, yeah, well, I should say on your left, but the inside boom puts out more product than the outside of the boom because the outside the boom travel faster around the circle. So that usually translates into herbicide damage. And also for specialty crops, this will give you a totally new way and different way to spray fruit trees, you know, whatever type of fruit tree this is, because you don't have to worry about all the drift created by an air blaster, you know, uh, although there are some newer uh, drift reducing air blasters out there. And this one will also spray a field of cucurbits, whatever type it is after one start to run. Because when we were running that uh, vegetable trial, have to spray fungicide every two weeks. And every time when we spray the fungicide every two weeks, we have to pull all the watermelon wines up, pull the wines, back up to the row because so we can walk in the row middle and spray it was a pain you know unless you have a big old sprayer that can cover a lot of rows at the same time but still it's gonna run over i have to run over in the middle somewhere somehow so you can only plant so many rows and then you have to leave one row out for the sprayer to ride on you know 
Uh, and that's if you have a big sprayer with 120 foot boom, you know, if you have the budget 400,000 ish to buy something like that. So if that's a concern or that's a limitation, these spray drones are much more affordable and they can spray over the top of the crop of Afro canopy overlap. For example, cucurbits or corn, whether this is sweet corn or field corn, you know, something like that, you can spray over the top just fine. Um, but for, for a ground sprayer, you don't want to run over the crops. So how does efficacy look like for those spray drones? The answer is unknown. We don't have enough data. But based on some of the work that has been done elsewhere, I know I stole this picture from uh, uh, Dr. Zing um, in the Virginia Tech. Uh, uh, you can see this is uh, glufosinate, uh, Liberty or Rely efficacy, no, Liberty or Rely herbicide. Uh, he sprayed with 15 gallon per acre using a backpack, uh, didn't kill the thick grass and bottom was green. You know, this happened all the time. Uh, for uh, contact herbicide like glufosinate and uh, paraquat, you know, like bromoxyl. Where he sprayed with drone at a two and a four gallon per acre, the grass control is a lot better. I believe this is because the drone has a downward pushing force, pushing force called propeller wash. And this propeller wash force opens up the thick grass, lay them down so your spray droplets can penetrate to the bottom and kill even the bottom of the plant. So if this effect can be replicated this year uh, in our trial in Alabama, we will feel a lot more comfortable to recommend uh, growers spraying with a spray drill. And we're trying to learn as much as we can from these new technologies so we can uh, educate growers the best way to utilize these new technologies. All right, I appreciate you for the time. Uh, hopefully I stayed in my time slot uh, to make the presentation. I've been told I can talk about 30 to 40 minutes.